on golf. Uh, so er earlier today, full disclosure, Phil and I did an entire episode breaking down. I was the there. I was there. Sorry, Dex. You were there and you did a great job. But Mackie and I thoroughly vetted, broke down the Viking salary cap situation uh, with the acquisition on Sunday and the signing of a one-year $12 million by, uh, deal by defensive end Yannick Ngakwe and what that was going to mean and the fact that Riley Reef was going to be released because the Vikings had gone to Reef on Monday with a restructured contract. And supposedly he said, no, I won't do that, and said goodbye to teammates. And so Reef was out the door, and we didn't like that because that's your left tackle. And, um, boy, things changed quickly a few hours after that uh, episode was recorded. Um, field JTSPN, I believe, Declan, is that correct? And Tom was Yes, he was first, and then I believe Rap, uh, uh, Palisero and Rap Sheet were able to confirm it as well. Which, uh, which, what they confirmed was Riley Reef has indeed agreed to a restructured contract. We don't know the details. I'm not mistaken. Reef was due to make $10.9 million this season. He will uh, now be coming back to the Vikings on a lesser deal. Let me start by saying this. Everything I said the first time around, which is, I don't like moving your right tackle to left tackle two weeks before the season. It strikes me as a mistake. Riley Reef is not going to Canton, Ohio when his career is done, but he's still not bad at what he does. Sure. Um, I apologize to Rick Spielman. I apologize to Zim. I apologize to everyone at TCO Performance Center of Performance, as our guy Matthew Collar used to call it. I like the Ngakwe trade. I didn't like Reef being let go, but Reef coming back now, I am completely on board De Declan Goff. And I will say this, I really do believe in my heart of hearts that the continuity of the offensive line matters. And if Reef has agreed to a restructure deal, bravo Vikings. How about that yeah. for me, Culpa? Wow. Yeah, I'm shocked that you uh, you are praising for for starters. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm truly shocked. Uh I, I do think this was the right move that they, that they did not release him. That was going to be a big mistake. Look, uh, I think guys like Oli Udo and, and obviously Rashad Hill, most notably, who has turned in from just a practice squad pickup four years ago to now who was we, what we thought is going to be your starting tackle. Like, good for him. I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is good for, good for Rashad Hill to, like, prove that I'm not just a practice squad guy. I deserve to be on a 53, and I have aspirations to be a starting lineman. Um, that being said, I think you were going to be setting yourself up for trouble, essentially removing one of your main tackles for the last three years. Take away how much he's paid for a minute. I know he's paid like a top fifth, top 10 tackle when he's really more like an average tackle in the NFL, but still a, a, a serviceable, usable tackle. People see the price tag, Judd, and they automatically write him off when he's actually a pretty solid player. So I think if they were going to tinker with their offensive line, removing such a big cinder block like that and trusting patchwork cinder black judd so now like you're, you're going you were going to the you know the the backwards the, the the backdoor construction store trying to fix this offensive line i don't care what the salesman is telling you that you can save two pennies on the dollar this was the right move to get rye reef back because removing him from the equation i think would have spelled trouble for the vikings exactly right and and look long term the, the move of brian o'neill from right tackle to the left side where he did play left tackle for a season in college of pittsburgh so he's played there before probably would have worked. What I hated about this idea was we're two weeks out and you're playing the Packers and they can guess what? Get after the quarterback, right? And oh, Kirk, yeah. Kirk Cousins, God bless him, uh, is next to being pretty much, uh, unless it's a designed rollout play, a statue in the pocket again, right? And yeah. so this whole idea of, of, and it's a continuing idea that the Vikings seem to have, which is, Let's steal from the offensive line to do this. Let's steal from the offensive line to do that. I absolutely hate that. And so if this works out now, and it appears it will, Reef is going to come back. I like it. Um, I would suggest that when, and I think the day will come, either Ezra Cleveland is going to play left tackle in 2021 for this team because Reef is not going to be back, or perhaps the plan is to play O'Neal at left tackle. I would suggest that when you're going to make that move, you give whoever the player is who's going to get that uh, protecting the quarterback blindside spot a lot of work there and a lot of prep and a lot of advanced warning, which they didn't do. But as far as the 2020 Vikings go now, uh, in Ngakwe, you've added what looks to be an elite right end who can rush the passer. I'm assuming that Daniil Hunter is going to be back from his mystery injury in week one as well at left end. Um, you are definitely going to be improved defensively over what the alternatives would have been if you hadn't gone out and made the trade for Ngakwe. And now your offensive line, I'm not trying, 
to be clear here, just to be very clear, I'm not trying to say that keeping Reef makes it great. I just like the fact that you're going to have those five guys in place and they've been in place for whatever this weird training camp has been. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel a lot better. I felt good or I felt better about the 2020 Vikings on Sunday after the Ngakwe trade. I felt sort of wishy-washy about what they were doing on the offense on Monday. And right now I'm back to feeling a lot better about what the Vikings plan for 2020 Declan Goff seems to be with, as Brett Favre would say, these pieces in place. Yeah. I think too, with offensive line, you brought up a point of continuity and that is humongous. I, when you talk about the, the superior offensive lines and teams that have good lines, Judd, it's all about guys who have been there together. So yes, it, it's good for the Vikings that they have depth, that they have guys uh, like Ole Udo who can step in or Dakota Dozier and, and Rashad Hill that it, it's not just TJ Clemmings. Like you have legitimate backups. That being said, they're most likely, I think Judd going to be backups in the NFL careers. Are there going to be times they're going to have to make starts this year because while well, the Vikings offensive line is a patched worked offensive line, certainly, but removing the biggest key cog in Riley Reef from the equation, if that's what you were going to do, if you were just going to cut him, I think that was going to be a massive mistake Two less than two weeks. We're not two weeks from the season. We are less than two weeks from your season opener. Fans are no fans at U.S. Bank Stadium. That does That's not going to stop Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith from coming after Kirk Cousins. We saw that with all the fans in the stadium last December, Judd, that that did not matter. The home field crowd did not do a difference. The Smith boys had their run all over Kirk Cousins. So I think... Keeping Riley Reef intact, I'm curious to see what that cap hit number comes down to, Judd. I'm not sure what the reports are, what you have heard that that number comes from 10.1 million, which is what it was initially. I'm guessing it probably comes down to maybe somewhere between four and seven, just a complete dartboard throw. Um, but it, it gives you more flexibility. I know the Vikes have a ton of dead cap. Chris Thomason noted that I believe the bike is now the seventh most dead money in the NFL with Riley Reef being restructured, which is... Yeah, it, it's frustrating because you have a block of money that's being paid for that's just sitting there and you can't use it. But Rob Brzezinski is a cap wizard, Judd. This, these are good things to have. So this is it's going to be okay. I'm glad they kept Reef. Two things. On Rob, you're right. He's fantastic. I mean, he, he's been here, I think, since 1999 now. Um, and his work on the salary cap at that time really saved this team because they had a few years there where the cap was just uh, had become a complete cluster bleed for – the Vikings. Uh, these things, though, you can only push so much of this cash down the road and these cap hits. So eventually they come home to roost a bit. So it's going to be intriguing to see in the next couple of years what the Vikings do cap wise. Rosinski gets creative, but I know there have been times where he's probably gone to Spielman and the Wilfs and said, I can't do more here. The second thing is, let's talk about Dex. Let's talk about the brutal nature of this business. Because the National Football League, I mean, all sports are cutthroat, but the yeah. National Football League is probably the worst. Think about this. And look, if I'm a Vikings fan, I'm glad Reef's back. If I'm a Vikings fan, I don't even know that I care what Judd Zolgad's about to tell me. But the nature of this business is two weeks before the season starts, you make a favorable trade, right? You then go to a veteran who's a left tackle, so he's not an unimportant player. And you basically say, you need to restructure. To which the veteran, not surprisingly, Declan Goff's like, whoa, whoa, what? Restructure? What? And then you tell him the stark reality of his situation. And Ian Rappaport of uh, NFL Network reported this. This is what happened in the last 24 hours to Riley Reef. okay? The Vikings essentially, I guess, told Reef's agent, you check around. We're two weeks out. Yes. Check on what the left tackle market is right now. And it sounds like they gave him the option to make phone calls and say, would you trade for my client current contract? So he's not going to restructure, but current contract to which the Vikings probably would have made the trade or had to. Two weeks out, he was probably told, hey, I got to go. I'm going to go get a pizza right now. Can't talk. Sorry. Like, think about this business. Think about the cutthroat nature. Think about the fact that you just told a guy who, by the way, is going to come back and you expect him to play his butt off for your team. You just told him, we got you. And in fact, the Vikings did. Right. Ryan Reed was telling his teammates yesterday, see ya, I'm probably gone. Nobody else. And again, he's a good, he's an, I think he's an okay left tackle, but he plays a premium position. But the Vikings so boxed him in, he had no choice but right. to probably take this pay cut. 
Yeah, Courtney Cronin, contributor to the program, says uh, says this as well on Twitter about an hour ago that the Vikings uh, had all the leverage basically in this. Like, right? They they ba- you talk about it being cutthroat. The Vikings had all the leverage, um, and no team was willing to pay Reeve close to ten point nine million this late in the season. So he ends up staying here because he's like, well, I've signed the contract. Yes, I understand it, but it's not guaranteed. So this. Th- it's it stinks if you're a player, and even our guy Alex Boone a few years ago, a year into this deal, they said, "Can you restructure?" And he said, "Hell no, I'm not restructuring. <laughs> I'm walking." So I can completely get it. I completely get it, Judd. Um, and and Riley Reef probably did the right thing too. I'm understanding you're upset. You thought you're going to make ten million dollars. Now you're probably going to make four or five, at least just for this year. You'll get that money back somewhere down the road. But it is a cutthroat nature, man. This is how it works, and I'm glad guys like Spielman and Brzezinski are on the team. Or will you get that back? Because he's not a kid, man. He might never get this back. This might be gone. The ship might have sailed. Riley Reef might never get this payday again. Um, speaking of leverage, we have a very interesting development in the world of the National Football League that affects a Viking player. And I got a question here. Okay. So right. so uh, reports have come down. I believe Rappaport, again, is this correct, from uh, yes. the National Football League Network reports this. Uh, ESPN, I think, has this too. Reports have come down that uh, Joe Mixon, who was a 2017 second-round pick by the Cincinnati Bengals, sound familiar, second-round 2017, has agreed to, and we don't have the particulars, but a four-year, $48 million, that sounds like total cash, not guaranteed cash, a contract with the Bengals that now keeps him under contract, including the final season of his rookie deal for the next five years. All right. If this sounds familiar, it should. Because also drafted in the second round 2017 was another running back. This one out of Florida State. This guy by the name of Dalvin Cook, who obviously has wanted and been talking to the Vikings until a couple weeks ago when negotiations broke down about a new contract from the Vikings. And much like Mixon, uh, Cook is playing now going into the final season of his rookie deal. The difference is he doesn't have set extension. Either the deal with uh, to cut Reef's salary has something to do with the fact that the Vikings are still cooking to try and give, no pun intended, Dalvin Cook a contract extension, and or the ship has sailed, uh, the Vikings are going to take the cash that they keep from Reef for a rainy day slush fund in, in case they have a catastrophic injury of some sort and have to sign a player and or players, plural, and Dalvin Cook is playing his last season as a Viking. No matter what the case is, uh, Derek Henry... Uh, Christian McCaffrey, now Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Declan Goff. This one to me is so intriguing because he has no choice but to play for the Vikings because if he doesn't play 2020 for the Vikings, if he sits out any amount of time, he becomes a restricted free agent next March instead of unrestricted. Dalvin Cook finds himself in a bind here contractually with no choice but to play And again, speaking of the brutality of the business, the Vikings could use this guy for everything he's worth and basically set him free to try and get a contract in a world in which the salary cap could go way down while guys like Henry and Mixon get paid. If Dalvin doesn't get a new contract soon, I am so curious to see his feeling on things because last time we talked to him, he was very upbeat about the world. I got to think at some point that's probably going to change. Yeah, I, I don't know, just with, especially with Ngakwe coming here, Judd, this was before the Mixon deal, obviously, I was just trying to figure out, well, now how the hell is this going to work? You're going to pay Ngakwe, which I don't, which I'm open to, obviously, he's 25 years old, I want an elite pass rusher but, uh, alongside Daniil Hunter for years to come, but then Daniil has this tweak, uh, a tweak, but it could be a contract issue because he's extremely underpaid for what he does, and now Dalvin Cook, who's still looking for his new payday, who held out a little bit from the virtual part of camps and now is back there and is all claims he's happy and things are going to get done, but Joe Mixon signs a $49 million deal. You look at the top five running backs right now. Christian McCaffrey, $16 million. We all know he's the best back in the league. Right behind him is Ezekiel Elliott, obviously one of the better backs in the league, two at $15 million. And then things start to dip a little bit. Lev Bell, 13.1 and on the tail end of his career. David Johnson, 13 mil on the tail end of his career. Derrick Henry, $12.5 million, who what extension he just signed, but I'm not sure how long he's going to be effective for. So that puts Joe Mixon at six at $12 million as the top six highest paid running backs. Dalvin, I, now I'm at the point where you're going to have to accept that you, you'll be lucky to get $10 million a season now. You'll be lucky to get $10 million a season. A lot to unpack there. Uh, for, first of all, it's an interesting conversation that when this started, 
So when the Cook uh, camp first approached or started to talk to the Vikings, the reports then from guys like our guy Doogie were that Dalvin Cook wanted Zeke Elliott money. And, and at that time, that was pre-McCaffrey contract, okay? And then McCaffrey signs, and like the Cook camp was now in, in that part of the deep end of the pool, which is a very deep end. And the Vikings rightfully said, uh-uh, no way. Supposedly, then I think it came down to, okay, we'll take David Johnson money. Um, and the Vikings were like, yeah. That's when, I saw, when I saw the Derrick Henry contract, I actually thought at that time, that's probably the fair contract. Right. But we, but we don't know what the particulars are of the offer that was taken off the table two weeks ago by the Vikings, which I'm pretty almost certain that the Cook uh, camp should have signed. And then to go to what you're talking about, which is a really interesting topic, is Ngakwe signed a way below market one-year $12 million deal for 2020. But he's going to be in line for a contract extension multi-year in March, right? If the Vikings go down that path, Daniil Hunter is going to show up on their doorstep, and rightfully so, and say, I got to get paid more. Okay, at that point in time, if these bookend uh, rushers prove to be as good as we think they're going to be. You want to keep them both, right? So you're going yeah. to want to pay them. You're going to want to pay them. Um, there are other contracts, people to pay, things coming up. You got to think that that there is no chance that uh, safety Anthony Harris is back in 2021. And there's a chance the Vikings try and pay Cook. But Declan, with each day that passes, my feeling is, there is a far greater chance that Delvin um, is used as much as he possibly can be this year by the Vikings and then told, good luck. I don't blame the Vikings. It's a brutal move. But if we're talking about, do I want to pay Ngakwe, maybe Hunter more, um, cornerbacks eventually more, and then we're going to talk about running back? Man, there's a lot of positions I'm going to pay, including guys that can get to the quarterback before I'm going to pay Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I mean, you can only kick the can down the road so far. And uh, I know that was that was an expression we used last year too in, in the offseason, trying to figure out how, how eventually you're going to have all these big paydays. And if I'm, if I'm Dalvin Cook and I'm his representation, I think you have until week one to figure this out. Like, I don't see them, I don't see them giving this extension by the time the season starts. So the clock is ticking. You're essentially at 12 days, less than that to really work out a new deal. And if there's no extension by week one, I be I think that's it. I think that's it. And then they're not going to... They, now, they could slap on a franchise tender to Dalvin Cook if they were able to get a deal, but they can't get Ngakwe done. So what the hell are they going to do? Like to, I, At this point, if you're not going to get the contract for Dalvin Cook done, Judd, I think that's it. And then you just replace with Alexander Madison and then the Madison after that in the draft, and, and that's where, that's how you go down it. Do you think that the... the uh... Mixing contract today, which, which again is a four-year, forty-eight million dollar extension, and it looks like forty-eight is the total package. Do you think that's bad news for Cook or good news? Because if the guaranteed cash in this is right, this could potentially set the market for Cook. And look, it might not; it's probably not going to come close to being the deal that he desired at the outset. But the reality in these pandemic times, salary cap almost certainly coming down, him playing a position that probably has a ceiling in most cases as far as the financial parameters go, this contract could help at least just establish a market that he has to take. Yeah. So I, like I, there's no more, there's no more let's go back and forth with numbers. There's no more getting cute. There is a here is the offer if you want it. And if you don't, good luck on the market. Next March. Yep. I, I think that this is the this is your final poker. I mean, this is like your final hand, right? Like you're you're literally at the final hand here. And if if you don't check, if you don't if you don't place the right bet, you're done. Like it, it, you have to go all in with the fact that what Joe Mixon got is the absolute ceiling of what you are going to get, Dalvin Cook. And the Vikings have to make that clear. And if Dalvin thinks he can get more on the open market from another team next year, then I say, All right, see you later. I'm pretty bullish on Dalvin Good Cook. Luck. I've defended him. I just I don't yeah. I don't know how it works anymore, man. I don't know how it works anymore. It's past my head. The St. Cloud State education only goes so far, Judd. No, I don't know. I no 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 no. I think you're exactly right. No, I think you've been very fair. I, I don't think it's past I think it's past the Cook camp's ability to reason about what they're gonna get. I think you're a thousand percent right.
definitely this is this is where you're gonna have to be at if you're Dalvin Cook. All right. It, it has been an emergency episode with Riley Reef agreeing to reportedly, we should say, a restructured contract with the Vikings. Um, he is Declan. I'm Judd. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Like everything we do, read our stuff at scorenorth.com. Look at all Declan's tweets. Right. We, we're, we're content machines. We'll talk to you later.